and it's the human experience my co-host dr g is with us we've also got shmuel cohen and his work on shamanic judaism welcome to hxp shmuel thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here yeah man it's uh your work is pretty interesting how did you get into this sort of pa- practice <laughs> well it's uh it's an interesting story um i was uh raised as a conservative Jew and had my bar mitzvah walked away from it. And after many years of looking at spiritual practices, I I found myself at a Celtic shamanic tradition called the Third Road. And was studying that, enjoying it, practicing it, and found myself in a problem one uh, after a while of doing a particular um, meditation. My teacher said, why do you light Shabbat candles, the Friday night candles, beginning of the Sabbath? And I said, no. She goes, you need to do that. I'm, and I said, wait a minute. We're doing a pagan practice here, not a <laughs> Jewish practice. She goes, that's what my guides are saying. So I said, okay, fine. And so I lit the candles on the Friday night, and it was amazing. It was like this curtain of calm and peace that just came down over my whole apartment. And the next morning I woke up and I did the meditation and it was clear as a bell. It was great. Um, Later on, we were, a lot of shamanic traditions, this one, uh, Third Road being one of them, works with your ancestors. So when I was doing meditations on my ancestors and Jewish ancestors were coming up because I'm Jewish, I said, this, I got to start looking into this um, and I need to understand my tradition in order to be able to work with them. So that got me started reading the Torah, which is the first five books in the Bible. And reading that from a shamanic perspective, from a perspective of energy work, I was blown away. I said, you know, there's a lot more going on here, that coat of many colors and a golden calf. And so that's what started me on the path back into Judaism, but looking at it from a shamanic perspective. That's interesting. Can you can you just go into some of what you know about the Kabbalah and why? I mean, on your site, you call it a powerful, mystical part of the Jewish tradition. I just want to know why you call it that. It's the... Uh, how do you describe it? It's kind of the fuel that runs the system, for lack of a better way of describing it. I would think from a Kabbalistic perspective, you have your thoughts, and you like, you have an idea, and you think about how you want to do it. Um, you know, just, I'm going to come up with something. I'm hungry. I want to eat something. Well, maybe I feel like having a hamburger. Great. But if I don't have very much emotional involvement in it, it I don't really get, I don't push myself to the action aspect of going out, making a hamburger, or going out and buying one. The Kabbalah is kind of the emotional aspect of this. It's the part that explains you've got a bunch of things. Uh, the Jewish tradition, it's a, uh, I don't like calling it a religion. I call it a practice, a spiritual practice. So there's a lot of various meditations and things that are done. Um, but the, well, the Kabbalah, what it does is it explains the underlying principles of how these practices actually help one connect to the divine creator. So on your site, it talks, you talk a little bit about how some Jews are afraid to admit they're Jewish. Is that my paraphrasing correctly? Yeah. Why do you think uh, that is? 2000 plus years of persecution. Um, there's a host of different reasons for it. Um, one of them is persecution. Um, if I admit to being Jewish, then there's a possibility of being somebody not liking that, and um, uh, there's prejudices and things like that. But there's also the uh, flip side of that, which is if I'm Jewish and I don't know very much about it, I, I'm afraid to go and be around other Jews. I'm afraid to go into a Jewish ritual. I'm afraid of messing up. I'm embarrassed that I'm going to make some sort of faux pas. Somebody's going to ask me something and assume I know something when I don't. And that's embarrassing. So maybe I just don't mention it. Or I know these practices and, you know, like myself, 
I was taught these things uh, in the 60s. Do this, do this. Why? I don't know. Just do them. Fine. Okay. There's no spirituality. I've learned another spirituality. I'm Jewish, but really I'm practicing Buddhism now or I'm practicing witchcraft now or I'm practicing Hinduism right now. And so that's what my, or a mixture of lots of different things. That's what my path is. So I don't really talk about being Jewish. So Shmuel, um, if you could go, uh, my understanding of Kabbalah is that it started in spot in Israel. Is that correct? Or in that region? Earlier, much, much earlier than that. So, so can you tell us a little more about the background of how this concept kind of ingratiated itself into Judaism? You mentioned that there's, uh, you're kind of a Buddhist, you're exploring these other realms, that there seems to be this Eastern mystical aspect to the Kabbalistic tradition. How did it find itself to these, you know, desert nomads in the... It's... <laughs> I'll probably <laughs> get, uh, get crucified for this, uh, pun fully intended. Um, it started with the Jewish people. It actually goes back to uh, to Adam, the primordial person. Um, Kabbalah means to receive. And if you're receiving, there has to be a giver. Now, the ultimate giver is is God. Um, in, uh, oftentimes, people say Hashem, which literally means the name, instead of using the name of God. God has no name. God has no form. God is so much bigger. God created this, but is way beyond this. So it's, you can't really describe God in Kabbalah. You call him Ein Sof, without end, infinity. Kabbalah means to receive. So the creator creates this world, creates Adam, the Adam, and they have a conversation. Everything that God speaks to Adam to Adam, to Eve, to Adam, to Eve, to Noah, and on through to the prophets, is things they receive. Kabbalah means to receive. So anything that's received from divinity is essentially a form of Kabbalah. So who, who is this God? Is this Yahweh, or is this the, the Yehud uh, Vadhe that they speak about in the Kabbalistic tradition, or is this more of the monad, the, the, the Hashem, the Elohim? What is the differentiation here? The differentiation between the names of God really are talking about different aspects of that God allows us to perceive of them. And when I say him, I'm also going to say her, because God contains the genders, but it's way beyond gender. God has no form. Um, Hashem has no form. The names are just aspects of divinity that we're allowed to experience. So what is, what is so, uh, why is everyone so fascinated about the pronunciation of God's name and the vibrational tone that that encompasses what is the effect that it has why is it so sacred because it's so powerful is there is there a resonance to the name or the frequency that gives it power yes exactly so there's uh, a, there are some um, like banishing rituals that use these, like the lesser banning ritual of the pentagram, are you aware of this? I'm not that familiar with it, no. No. Uh, in shamanic Judaism, are do you guys use rituals, invocation, stuff like that? Uh, yes. So you uh, are so you are using these sort of sacred names to either invoke or banish. They can be used that way, yes. Can you give us an example of that? I would rather not, and the reason I would rather not do it is the names are powerful, and to actually use one of the names would actually be to invoke it and invoke the power of it. If what I would do, say, um, wow. if I was looking <laughs> for a situation of mercy, I might use the four-letter name in a form of prayer. Um, in fact, the best the best way to create a ritual is to do it in a, in a prayer. You know, you are, you're asking the question, what's the difference between uh, Jewish shamanism, say, and a different other forms of shaman, shamanism or magic. Right. And the way I would, there's kosher magic and non-kosher magic. The difference between it is, and this is where I love to use uh, my more modern metaphors, 
Have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? I can't say I have. I have. Okay. <laughs> there's there's a couple of characters in there. There's a magician and there's a cleric. The magician gets his power from the words, from the um, way he moves his body, um, from the magical items. The cleric gets his power from praying to his deity, and the deity then grants the request. Okay, the cleric is kosher magic in Judaism. As soon as you start saying that I have the power, it all belongs to me, or these words are the thing that actually manifests the particular act, or this wand or this sword um, or this pentacle is where the power lies, you're now basically acting, creating idol worship. Because you're saying the power is there, the power is not with the the creator. When I say creator, divinity, uh, the universe, however you want to describe it, it we're talking about something indescribable beyond that. Um, but it's, but it's, yeah, you have to give credit where the credit's due in Judaism. So being so, more, of a, being more of a vessel. Exactly, exactly. So it's possible. You know, the greatest of the well, the, sage, the least of the sages of the Jewish sh- shamans from 2,000 years ago could resurrect the dead. How would they do it? They would use the name of God. Um, and I would just, I'm, they would use the name of God. But what they're doing is they use that name to make a request of God. Um, and if their desire matches God's desire, matches the universal desire, then that person gets resurrected. Hmm. Um, so you, you're right. You, it's basically becoming a vessel for the for the for the divine flow for the universal will to accomplish its goal. So, so the Torah says that one should learn the Torah and get a teacher to teach them how to study, and then to get a student to teach them how to teach. Do you agree with this? Yes. Yes. And uh, how long how long have you been teaching? I've been teaching for about six years now. I started while I was in Israel. Uh, I put together a workshop using the uh, the story of the exodus of the Jews out of Egypt as a um, as a container for how to overcome uh, whatever is keeping you from moving forward to your hopes and dreams. When you when you mentioned earlier about um, the magician and the cleric, it sounds a lot like the the arcanum from different tarot decks. Is is there something akin to that in the cabal, the kabbalistic tradition that you guys use? Are you are you playing with divination? Divination is an interesting thing in Judaism. Uh, I mean, Judaism has astrology. The uh, the zodiac signs match up to the twelve tribes, um, and there's a story of Abraham, who's having a conversation with God, and God says, "You're going to have ch- children. You're going to have lots of children." And Abraham's like, "Well, wait a minute. I've looked at the stars. The stars say I'm not going to have any children. So how can you say, God? How do you say I'm going to have children?" And in fact, at the uh, at the beginning, when it talks about creation. God says the stars and the planets are going to be um, there to tell you the times, uh, planting seasons, and also for me to give you messages. So the trick about it is these are used, uh, you can't, they're not to be div- used as divination to say, this is what I must do, this is what I must do. It's more of, suggestions this is the direction that things are going in you you, can't change that you can overcome those uh those tendencies but that's what the tendencies are so you you pretty much would say for a fact that you believe supernatural forces are at work and at least preserving the jewish people and what is the purpose in that if that's so (laughs) (laughs) i'm sorry i just want to get right to it (laughs) okay well i missed the joke in that one (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that gets down to the question of why we're the chosen people now, doesn't it? 
Just to clarify, my co-host happens <laughs> to be Jewish. And it, now, this work is really interesting, man. And I, I really just want to know what, how shamanic Judaism differs from other aspects of shamanism. I mean, like the Native Americans have shamans. There are shamans in the Amazon. So how, how are the Jews practicing these shamanic traditions? Poorly, <laughs> to be honest. Um, fundamentally, I would, and I haven't spent a lot of time talking to um, Native American shamans or South American shamans, but um, the shamans that I have talked to, fundamentally, things, uh, the roots of things are pretty much the same. Um, there's uh, you can go into different worlds. You're playing with uh, unseen energies. Um, you're trying to heal and improve things. The question becomes um, the process you're using to do that. Okay, let's let's get into that. How so? How do you use energy and to heal? And how are you becoming aware of these? Like, can you go into some of the practices that you guys use? So one of the important things is the concept of kavana. Kavana is a Hebrew word that translates to focus, concentration, intention. Uh, the second piece is um, the idea of a mitzvah. Now, a mitzvah normally translates into commandment. And people think of it as good deeds. So helping an old woman across the street is a mitzvah. It's a good deed. It also has another meaning, and that is it creates a connection like a pipeline between you and uh, and divinity, you and the, and the creator. So if I am doing, and there's 613 of these for the Jewish people. Other people, the traditions, I'm sure, have their versions of these. Um, and what it does as I'm doing one of these things, such as um, keeping, keeping Shabbat is a mitzvah. What Shabbat is, it's a time where I'm going to go into a sacred space for a whole day, and I'm going to commune with the feminine aspect of God. And when I come out of that, I can bring out some of that energy, and then I can and whatever revelations I've got, and then be able to use it and apply things that I've gotten from that interaction into the world. Hmm. Very interesting. I mean, it, it sounds like you're describing the crown chakra, basically. I mean, the, the, the concept of opening up that, that top portal into, into, into the consciousness, into the great divine. But what is the relationship, I, I was trying to ask this earlier, as far as with the Jews that makes you guys so special with that with that consciousness, are you? Was there some kind of pact made? I mean, what is the lineage of the? What is the relationship the Jews have with the monad, which with the divine? Um, here's what I believe. I believe that Judaism, first of all, says we talk about primordial man, the original Adam, where Adam and Eve come out of. Uh, that is a primordial man. It, cr it contains all of humanity. Um, and in the form of human being, in the sense that there's different organs. Each, uh, each uh, native group, uh, aboriginal people, the Jewish people, the Native Americans, the Australian aborigines, all, all of them represent different organs in this body and have a different purpose and a different role. So the Jews are chosen for one thing. Um, the other traditions are chosen for different things. The Jewish I f purpose, I believe, is to help bring down uh, the uh, divine power pack, uh, the godly energy, the godly light, uh, into this world so that other people have access to it and then can use it for the things they need to use to do with it and to do it in a safe way. Hmm. So, so then have you experienced any form of d like demonic exorcism or anything on that level in your practice? <sighs> yeah. 
I have. How often does that occur? Um, for me personally, not very often. Um, How often do you find that there are negative entities or beings that are affecting a person's life that, that you feel that you have to become involved in that situation? Okay, let me back up a second what I, what I said. Okay. Because uh, I want to change your question a little bit. I don't want to say, say demonic. Judaism has two sides, or Kabbalah has two sides. It has the side of holiness. And it has what's called the Sitra Achra, which is Aramaic, literally meaning the other side. And the other side is, I think, what you would call demonic. Judaism doesn't really believe in a demonic per se, because um, everything ultimately is good. God, uh, the, uh, are you saying Moad or Noad, with an N or an M? With an N? Okay, a Noad, is a giver of good. Everything that comes out of the noad is, by definition, good. Anything we're perceiving as bad and evil is only from our limited perspective on how it works. And if we had the perspective, an infinite perspective, we would see and understand how it's actually there to um, to strengthen us and make us better. But from our inner perspective, from our constricted understanding and perception, it looks evil to us. Um, so having said that, there is this idea of a sitra akhra, and it's the part of us that is, it's always with us, and it's always tempting us to do what is not in our best interest, uh, to do not, uh, what is not in the, uh, in the world's best interest. How would the process of initiating a shaman work in your practice. I mean, if, if let's say that I wanted to practice shamanic Judaism, do I have to be Jewish to practice this? To do it in a serious way. Yes. Okay. So it's relegated to the, the Jewish people. I, I wouldn't be able to, I'm not Jewish, so I wouldn't be able to practice this. <laughs> it's a Jewish form. Correct. But you know, whatever tradition, it's a question of working with what is appropriate for I mean, what is appropriate for your soul, what works best, what what your system is designed uh, to work with. You think genetically, or the, the Jews are priests, but spiritually. At this point, I'm talking about the soul. The Judaism really uh, is. I mean, it talks about the physical world, but it's also and this is what Kabbalah is really talking about, is not the physical world, it's talking about all the other worlds. Um, and I imagine if you go to any traditional shaman from a traditional place, and you really sat down and talked to them, they would probably say their system is for their people, and only their people. It's not something that you can take out and use generically in a very, in a very effective form, because you need to have the cultural background in order to work in order to work it for example if i was uh let's say i was a uh, a shaman who worked with rattles and um and used that as part of the healing and went into trances and invoked animal spirits so that i would be moving around like an animal um for, for the people who that works for that, who is part of that tradition, it makes sense and it works. Um, to take someone who's from, to take that shaman and put him into the middle of, of um, um, trying to think of uh, like Cleveland, for example, and say, this, is, this guy is going to heal you uh, instead of going to your doctor. Someone's going to come in there, and it's not going to be very effective because that's not the modality that they work with. They don't believe into it. They don't buy it. They don't understand it. It's not part of their spiritual DNA. Okay, so it is genetic. So um, let me just—I'll just moving on here. Um, is is it kosher to use psychedelic plants to enter these sort of shamanic states? The these vision sort of quests that you guys go on or how does that work 
the anointing oil that was used for the high priest and the king uh, included, there's an opinion that says it includes uh, cannabis. Hmm. Do you, do you think that um, the burning bush, I mean, there's a lot of accounts that think that it was an acacia plant, which is very high in uh, dimethyltryptamine. Do you think there's any truth behind that as far as you know, Moses was out on Mount Sinai or Mount Ararat tripping on acacia plants and tripping bringing balls. that? Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes you wonder. You know, there, there is the, 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 there's botanical psychedelic plants that every – I think everyone except for the Inuits, for the most part, has dabbled with, and it stands the reason that the Jews would have their form of it. Yeah, uh, it's very, very possible. There's uh, there's actually a story in the Talmud. Um, I'll give you a very, there's a very short version of it. Uh, there was a one of the shamans was known as uh, Yoni the Circle Drawer because he would put himself in a circle in order to do his uh, his chance work. And at one point, the people asked him to make it rain. So he went, and long, again, long story short, he made it rain, and because there had been a drought and there was enough rain, they asked him to stop the rain, he stopped the rain. And then the people went out into the, uh, into the woods to collect mushrooms. I'll leave it to you to uh, understand what kind of mushrooms they were probably collecting. Have you read um, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, the, the book The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross? No, I haven't. There's – I forgot the author's name, but he talks about how the, the ancient Jewish sect that was the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were basically you know, taking psilocybin mushrooms and worshipping and venerating the, the psilocybin, the, these mushrooms. And there's you know, drawings in their, in their caves and different writings about that. What's, what's your take on that? It points out one of the dangers uh, of using uh, drugs or using anything else to help you get into the um, into those uh, altered states, and that is you start worshiping them. And as soon as you start worshiping them, believing that's where the power lies, then you're starting to do idol worship because you're starting to forget the fact that really what's allowing you to get into those spaces is the no ad. So you, um, you, you mentioned power. The thing that I've always wanted to try to comprehend, I'm sure everyone's trying to figure out is what, what in the hell is going on with the space in Jerusalem where the Western wall is? Is, is there some kind of energetic hotspot coming out of that ground? Like why does everyone want to be in that zone? That is the place where the physical and non-physical worlds meet. What does that mean? <laughs> when God comes into the into the world, let me let me back up a second. Let me kind of the finite world. I'm going to use another uh, popular analogy. I like Star Trek, so I'm going to use a Star Trek analogy here for just a moment. Um, this world is a is a world of matter. And one of the things that defines matter is the fact that it's finite. So if I want to talk about something that is antimatter, I'm talking about something that's infinite, that's beyond finite. That would represent the noad. So if the noad wants to come into this world, we've got a problem because when you have matter and antimatter coming together, you're going to make a very large explosion. It needs to be controlled and contained. Uh, the location where the noad comes into this world, where the finite world gets created from, where the universe gets created from, that doorway is on the Temple Mount, is where the west is in the area where the Western Wall is, is the spot underneath the where the Golden Dome, uh, the uh, the mosque of the Golden Dome is, and that's why it's such a huge PowerPoint, um, and that's why everybody's fighting over it. Can, can you please describe for our listeners the, the process? So I, what is it, the Kohen, I believe, or is it the rabbi that goes in there once a year during Yom Kippur or during the High Holy Days? What, is, what are they doing? Like, so they're going into the Temple Mount. There's this portal into the heavens, you're telling us. Is this where the, how is the Ark of the Covenant involved here? What, what, is, what is the actual 
what is going on? <laughs> that's, that's a really, really, really good question. Um, and uh, it's the high priest. And the high priest is the um, high shaman of the tradition. Yom Kippur being the uh, holiest day. People are fasting and praying because they're trying to create this uh, this um, very sensitive and very special um, sacred space and that allows the high priest to go in to the place where the finite and the infinite meet. Now, if you can imagine going into a place we're aware of four dimensions, maybe some people are aware of five or six. I'll give uh, credit to that, but go into a place where there's an infinite number of dimensions and where you've got a physical body, but the physical body doesn't mean anything. Um, the Holy of Holies is a place where uh, it's got a set dimension, but you can put the, uh, the ark is actually too big with, these, with the uh, stays in it. It's too big to fit in this place, and yet it does. It's a place that holds more than it should be allowed, should be able to. And why can it do that is because it's going into all these other dimensions because it has the ability to move into the infinite. So are things and being so, stored there? It's, a, it's the doorway. It's the gateway. It's the conduit between the infinite place and the finite place. It's the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is going in there and he's having the ultimate mind expansion. He is able to perceive uh, things from a, an infinite level uh, and understand it, anything and everything all at one time, past, present, future, and is able to come out of that and be sane. And in fact, the only time that the four-letter name of God is actually mentioned is he comes out. He is actually told it at that time. It can be pronounced differently all the time because it depends on what how you vowel it and it's most mostly a breath type sound so he comes out at that moment right after this incredible experience um going into the highest of the highest of the highest worlds and then says that name and that name is so powerful it purifies everybody and everything can you go into the uh the, the chanting involved in the, the four worlds, what, what does that mean? Where have you seen, where, where can you give me? I have, I have some sources that have told me about the four worlds. I just want to know more about them. Uh, is, is, this, is this stuff sort of secret? Is that why you're, you're being so reluctant to talk about it? Or is it because I'm not Jewish? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'm, asking, I'm asking a question partly to see what some. There's a lot of things that I know. There's an awful lot of things I don't know. I mean, what I compared to what, who my teachers are, I know. I know practically nothing. Can you give us a human experience exclusive? Like, give us some secret esoteric I, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, and there's. I mean, I have a class where I spend five hour, uh You know, it's a five week class. You know, five hours where I'm just going over a basic overview of Kabbalah. And that's because there's a lot of background, uh, background material. The, cha- the chants that you're referring to, I don't know. Okay. Um, there are probably a couple different versions of them, I would imagine, depending on, the, on different sects of Kabbalists. But yes, there are the Kabbalists who were in spot 500 years ago. Um, but you've also got uh, 800 years ago, you have the Kabbalists who were in Spain. And you've got, before that, you've got the Kabbalists who were in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And there's Kabbalists today. And each, each one of those groups different at a different time has different needs and different ways of doing things. So, um, and um, there might be books that describe some of those chants now, but the chants are not... I'm, I, I don't know them. I haven't learned them partly because it's a very dangerous thing to start moving up into these worlds if you really don't know what you're doing and you don't understand the mapping of it. What's the uh, danger? What, is the, what do you mean by danger? Okay. The, 
there is a there's a story about four sages from two thousand years ago who go into the orchard. Now the orchard is a uh, is symbolic for the four four worlds. There's the world uh, that we live in, the world of the sea, the world of action. Then there is the world of Yitzira, the world of formation, the world of Bria, the world of creation, and then there's the world of Atzilut, which is nearness to God. Uh, so these four uh, shamans, these four very high shamans, go into this meditation. Hmm. One of them dies inside. One of them comes out as a heretic. One of them comes out crazy. And one of them, Rabbi Akiva, he goes in in peace and he comes out in peace. Now, what's going on with this is there are, when one, a person reads the Torah, and Torah, by the way, is an instruction manual. Torah means instructions. It comes from the same root as Mora, which is a teacher, and Hora, which is a parent. Um, there is the, there is, so when you're studying this, you're studying it ideally on four levels. One is I'm looking at the letters and what letters are missing, what letters are big, and how they're spaced within on the on the parchment. Okay. Then there is another level of these all the words, everything that's being talked about is symbolic of something else. There is another level where I'm looking at the words and I'm starting to play with the meanings of the words. What if I change the vowels because the Torah doesn't have vowels? and use an esoteric meaning of a word, or something of that nature. And then there's a fourth way, which is the mystical way. Uh, it's the hidden thing. I'm going into a meditation, and I am receiving something I'm, uh, from an inspiration of understanding of what's going on here. So what happened when they went into this meditation? Um, one of the things the Torah says is that if you, um, if you obey your parents, you live a long life. And if you, and this is going to sound crazy, I know, but I'm going to sh share it anyway. If you want eggs and there's a mother bird, you shoo away the mother bird and you take the eggs, you get a long life. So what happens? This one, uh, the one who died, he, uh, excuse me, the one who became a heretic, he saw a little boy being told by his parents to go fetch some eggs. He climbs, he goes and he gets the egg, shoots the mother bird, gets the egg. He went up in a tree to do it. And he fell from the tree and he died. And the guy said, well, wait a minute. This doesn't match what our, what our instruction manual says. Therefore, there's a problem here. I can't deal with it. I can't handle it. He's too involved in the literal meaning uh, of what's going on. And the second one goes in there, and he's the one, the one who goes crazy is the one who's looking at symbolism. So he's, he's, look, he's looking at it. It's like, imagine somebody... Here it goes, you know, it's 11, it's 11, 11. That must mean something. Wow. And it's, you know, February 2nd, 2, 2. That must mean something. And see, suddenly some birds went flying overhead. That must mean something. You can go crazy thinking everything is symbolic and omen for something else. And so that person went crazy. The person who uh, died, what he did, he didn't really die. What he did was he went in and he goes, this is amazing. There's this new insight, and there's this other insight, and this, he just kept going forever and ever and ever into more and more into the infinite realm. Uh, and Excuse, got let me just interrupt here for a second. I'm sorry that, that kind of went off track. I'm trying to figure out. I mean, let's bring it back into the realm of practical. What is it that you do when you're journeying? Like as you're, I mean, what is something that you can do? If, if, if someone feels a sort of negative vibration and they happen to be taking one of your classes, what is something that you would instruct them to do first? One of the things that I'm, I, would ha I might have them do would be to um, uh, invoke uh, the four archangels. Okay, that's uh, practical. Around them. Pardon? That's practical. Keep going. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I would do myself would probably, I mean, I would go and try to see what the entity was and, uh, and do what I could to get rid of it or pacify it or understand what was there. Um, there is a prayer, um, for, uh, for healing. 
uh, Rafua Shlema, meaning complete healing. Um, I would have the um, and have the person probably. Well, again, it depends on what the what's causing it. Okay, fair um, enough. Um, yeah, I mean there there are a lot of kind of if if you look into like the stuff about like evil eye and people who are sending out like h- how do you defend against something like that? Do you have sacred symbols or things that you write that could sort of defend against that? Are there you're you're talking in the realm of amulets at this point, and I'm not an expert on amulets. I have a friend of mine who knows much more. Um, I don't know if they want their name mentioned, so I'm not going to. Okay. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things you could do. You could uh, the um, Star of David is actually a shield and a, a protection device. You could put that around you in a couple different ways. You could be in the center of it. You could put a series of six of them around you in the four directions and above and below. Um, Invoking the name of God is, and at that point, uh, you can do that. You can invoke uh, Gabriel, who is a defender, is uh, is a warrior aspect of God. If I was doing healing work, I might use uh, Raphael, who is the healing aspect of God. Um, I might take a shofar, which is a ram's horn, and blow it and try to uh, uh, scare things out that way. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can be done depending on what the what the situation, what the cause of it is. Uh, the, but the the big thing would be a lot of it would be having to do, would be praying uh, to God to take care of it. In fact, that's probably the first and probably the most powerful thing a person could do. Because nothing can stand up to the no ad. So you were describing a lot of it sounds like sacred geometry from an esoteric Judaic perspective. Can you tell us a little more about that and how the Hebrew letters actually have a numerological uh, value to them and what that system what that system exactly is? Judaism the the Hebrew letters are also are also the Hebrew numbers. Um, so an Aleph is a one, a Bet is a two, a Gimel is a three. Um, and you start getting into the realm called Gematria, which is working with the numbers. The If you think of, did you have you seen the movie The Matrix? Sure, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, do you remember the scene in there where they're looking at the computer screen and the guy's going, you're seeing a bunch of numbers scrolling down and I'm seeing a brick wall and a beautiful blonde and a dog walking by? Mm-hmm. Okay, if you substitute the uh, numbers to the Hebrew letters, this is what, uh, this is what Kabbalah believes. We, it, everything is made up of Hebrew letters. Um, and a way of looking at it is uh, the Hebrew letter, the numbers represent vibrations. Each letter has its own particular vibration. So if I manipulate the letters, I can actually recreate things. Um, and if I can take things that have similar numeric values, then I can actually uh, I can actually use those and substitute those and create different things with them um, and understand them better. For example, um, uh, let me think of uh, ahaba means love, and uh, echad is one, which if you take the numeric value of both of those words, each each equal 13, add them together, you get 26. The four-letter name of God equals 26. So one love, a nice uh, Bob Marley song, is actually a name of God. Hmm. So is this where the Masons get a lot of their uh, concepts from? I mean, th- I'm assuming a lot of this numerology is inherent in the temple and the construction of the temple in a lot of the the verses i think it was you know weren't they saying that if you look at the torah there's like hidden there's hidden messages every so every couple of letters or they said that you could find 911 or nostradamus like predictions in the talmud or the torah is what do you think what do you take on that absolutely uh the torah codes i actually have a friend of mine in israel who's been working on them uh, using computers, 
where they're going every certain number of uh, letters or going up and down um, and uh, and finding names that way and uh, words and descriptions that way that are matching up with things um, much more a much larger statistical uh, success rate than you would expect. So there's definitely that going on. Um, but I'm but I'm talking about it also. I mean, the numerics in Judaism, uh, you've got uh, there's a lot of different meanings in them. Forty is a number of completion. Seven is a number of uh, you've got uh, of um, totality in the sense that the physical world has got six directions and then the center, which is seven. That's what makes seven so important. Three is a number of stability. Um, eight becomes a number transcendent because what do you have when you after you've completed this physical world? The only place to go after that is beyond this world. So that's what number eight represents. Um, so I can take these concepts and now I can, uh, and then I can form words using these that add up to these particular numbers. Um, or I can take sentences and put them together, um, and um, and use those because those add up to various names of God. So instead of using the name of God, I might use a sentence. Um, and then there's various ways of opening up the name of God. Um, and, you know, the four-letter name. If I take each each letter and spell it out, the Yud, for example, the first letter is uh, spelled with uh, three Hebrew letters, and the He is spelled with three le three letters. And then if I take those as numerics and I add them together, I get a particular number. And depending on how I spell each letter, I come up with a different numeric, and those different numerics represent the different worlds I'm going into. Do you ever play the lottery using those numbers? Because I've always wanted to try that. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't even thought to do that. It's an interesting idea. <laughs> uh, so, Shmuel, we, we are... Um we're approaching the end here, man. Is there is there anything, any message that you want to get out to the people who are listening, specifically the Jewish people, our Jewish audience, and the people that you kind of are suggesting may be afraid of being Jewish? Do you have anything to say to them? I would say yes. Um, I would say have an open mind and be willing to uh, study and explore the tradition, don't take the things that you've heard about it and assume that they're right and accurate. Actually go in and explore it. Read the sacred books themselves. Uh, and if you could learn Hebrew and study it from the original sources, it's even more powerful because you wind up with some very interesting ideas. And I'm going to give you one if, if I have a few minutes here. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. There's a story at the beginning of creation. There's the of the Adam and Eve. By the way, Eve's Hebrew name is Chaya, which means life. Um, and the 18 is life, the numeric value of the Chet is 8, the Yud is 10. Ha, it spells Chaya, and it adds up to 18. So 18 is a powerful, magical number in Judaism. But they're in the Garden of Eden, and there's a serpent that comes along and uh, tempts Eve, and they eat from the tree, and... You know, everything goes downhill from there, so to speak. Okay, a couple of thoughts on that. The word for the serpent, uh, the numeric value for that, happens to equal the Hebrew word for the Messiah. So the Messiah is somehow involved in that snake, in that serpent, causing and making this whole thing happen. The Messiah that we're waiting for, that's going to bring this, you know, the world to its glorious conclusion is involved, directly involved, in causing uh, the downfall for, of eating from the fruit. There's Which the is the Antichrist in the Christian uh, tradition. Well, the, the Antichrist then must have lived, uh, you know, was hanging out at the, uh, in the Garden of Eden. Okay, fine. Um, I want to take a slightly different look at that and say what was really going on there. Now, the word uh, for the serpent was Nahash. Nahash also happens to be a type of divination. So I'm going to say that the story is not, there's no, never any serpent, rather uh, rather Eve, Chaya, 
was trying to understand, trying to divine what uh, what Hashem really was asking. When Hashem said, don't eat from this tree, what was the real message there? And I'm going to speculate, now that I'm going into this place, if she was doing some sort of divination, perhaps her thinking process went like this. God wants proof, Hashem wants proof that there's free will. The only way to prove free will is to go against what God wants. So maybe when God said, was, said this one tree, wink, wink, pointing at it, don't eat from it. Well, if you ask any human being, you can do anything you want except for one thing. What if that immediately is going to draw their attention to it and make them want to do it? So maybe Eve really was trying was coming kind of using this divination process to divine the underlying message of I want proof of free will. Go and eat from this. Disobey me directly in this one instance. That was suspected. That's what led her to eat from the tree. The so question. So uh, that there, so that's a way of looking at and understanding the story, which you can only get if you've looked in, into the Hebrew. So, you know, you said that you mentioned you you follow kind of a, a Buddhist Eastern uh, mystical path. Just want to follow, uh, follow follow up on this. Uh, what is your? Let, let me correct. I I don't study a Buddhist middle uh, Eastern path. I never have. I've done a little bit of. I uh, studied a little bit of Buddhist meditation. I studied a Celtic. I've studied a Celtic shamanic tradition. But you're open a, to the Eastern, the Eastern traditions. You're you're open to it. I would oh, say, right? Absolutely. Each tradition is perfectly valid and powerful in its own way. So, um, so in that in that vein, wh what is your stance on Jesus? Was he a Jewish mystic who kind of dabbled in this similar Eastern philosophy? Was he a zealot, or was he just this construct that the Roman Empire used as like a mass opiate? Uh, I believe that Jesus was a uh, was a Jew who um, had studied the shamanic tradition and uh, was saw a lot of uh, Jews who were not uh, who were doing things that they should, uh, that were causing a lot of problems and was trying to correct that. Um, and the Romans, uh, for political reasons, uh, had him crucified. All right, Shmuel. Well, you know, I really appreciate you being here, man. Was was there? There's. I know you have a website. What's what is that for us? It's ConsciousTorah. dot com. C o n s c i o u s t o r a h. dot com. com. Right. And. Uh, and the reason for the name is, the, I think the purpose of the Torah is to, in Judaism, is to raise consciousness and raise awareness um, of who we are and what we are and how we interact with each other and with the world and with uh, and with the unseen world as well. And, and I know that math, that you've, do it. you've got a workshop coming up, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? The workshop is, thank you for asking, uh, I call it Judaism 101, and there's, uh, you know, it's designed for people who uh, don't know very much about Judaism, um, or uh, want to know more about it, are embarrassed because they don't know anything, or maybe they've learned a little bit and they've been frustrated with what they've learned and they want to uh, get something deeper and more uh, more experiential um, and understand the underlying things as opposed to the same a bunch of rules that say do this and don't do that uh, so it's a you know, it's a three month program that will be starting next month um, online okay and and, and they can uh, find that on your website it'll be coming up on the website in probably in, a, in another week I'll have the details of it there if they're interested, they can get a hold of me on my website. There's a contact page, um, and they can ask there. And uh, if my phone number is not up there, it will be up there soon. Cool. Well, guys, this is The Human Experience, me and my co-host, Dr. G, and we are signing out. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to my guest, and you can find his work at ConsciousTorah.com. Thanks for listening, guys.